Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for those who've survived so far. <laughs> okay, this is the last session of the day. It's never easy to be presenting after lunch. I suppose everyone is tired and wants to get home. So um, we've got uh, two fantastic speakers this afternoon uh, who I'm going to have the privilege to present. So I'm going to present first uh, Dr. Riara Maria Kamel. Oh, okay, sorry, uh, apologies. So just I'm going to present Ms. Yara Maria Kamel, uh, who's a clinical psychologist and a clinical team coach at the Workplace Options in uh, Dubai, here in the UAE. Uh, the title of her talk is uh, A Psychosocial Rehabilitation Model for Successful Return to Work After Physical or Mental Health Related Absence. Uh, Yara is an experienced clinical psychologist who's worked in France, Lebanon, and Dubai. Since 2017, she's been providing counseling and support to employees and their families at Workplace Options, uh, also known as WPO, which is an employee assistance program. And she also coaches the WPO clinical team her previous experience includes uh, working in, in a clinic, uh, sorry, in a clinic specialized in vocational rehabilitation in France, where she supported individuals living with severe psychiatric disabilities. She presented at the World Association for Psychosocial Rehabilitation 12th Congress uh, in Seoul in uh, South Korea in 2015, focusing on vocational rehabilitation as a key factor in the recovery of individuals living with severe mental illness. Um, Yara holds two master's degree in clinical psychology and psychopathology uh, in the, uh, the workplace from uh, Université Paris. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. I'm not sure how to pronounce the rest of it. Diderot, Paris, set? Okay, so my French is not off the mark completely. Uh, her professional interests uh, include developing and implementing evidence-based interventions to support individuals with mental health issues in the workplace helping them return to work and achieve their full potential. Uh, she's very passionate about raising awareness on mental health issues and promoting mental wellness in the workplace. So please join me in welcoming Yara. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's the first time someone introduces me, so. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining me. Um, so yeah, so I'll be presenting um, our work um, of the Readaptation, so Rehabilitation Department in France and Belgium, which illustrates our psychosocial rehabilitation model for successful return to work after a physical or mental health related absence. Um, our psychosocial rehabilitation model is designed to address the complex needs of employees returning to work after a prolonged health or mental health related absence. And it takes into consideration the psychological, social, physical and occupational aspects of an employee's needs and well-being to ensure a return to work in the most favorable conditions. So in today's fast-paced work environment, retain, returning to work after a health-related absence can pose significant challenges because it's not just about the physical recovery, but also the psychological and social aspects that come into play. Without proper support, the failure rate of return to employment can be high. And this is why the need for support on returning to work becomes crucial. We need effective strategies and models to support individuals as they navigate the challenges of returning to work after a health-related absence. And this is where the WPO model for psychosocial rehabilitation comes in. Our model is designed to address the multidimensional needs of individuals returning to work after a health-related absence. It involves a comprehensive approach and is adaptable for different health um, concerns and mental health concerns. We understand and accept that every individual situation is unique and our model can be tailored to meet their specific needs. And the best part is that our model has shown itself to be effective in supporting individuals in their successful return to work. And we've gathered data that I'm going to share with you which demonstrate the positive impact of our model on the individuals returning to work after a prolonged health-related absence. So today I'm going to explain the problem of returning to work after a prolonged health-related absence, describe the WPO model for psychosocial rehabilitation, and demonstrate its effectiveness. So as a way of explaining the problem at hand, I want to highlight that serious health issues, including mental health issues, often induce disruptions in a person's life 
and can momentarily prevent a person from pursuing his work in order to receive treatment. And any delay between the interruption of a job <coughs> to access health care and a possible return to work is a factor impeding reintegration. Returning to work after a long absence can often be a source of anxiety, and this is especially true when the cause of absence is related to a mental health disorder. Exclusion from professional environment and the resulting social consequences favor a process of psychological and social disengagement, which increases correlatively as the length of the absence extends. So assisting a person to return to work after a health-related absence is challenging for several reasons. And an analogy can be made between a car merging into, onto a highway and a person returning to work. Just as a car needs to accelerate to the appropriate speed to merge onto the highway, a person needs to resume the pace of work upon returning to their job. And the goal of our rehabilitation department is to help individuals resume the speed they need they need to be at, uh, to be productive in their work. But the impact and consequences of prolonged employee absence from work creates a double bind challenge affecting both the employee and the organization. On one hand, the company continues to evolve and transform it, um, during the prolonged absence of the employee in terms of technique, equipment, and work methods. And on the other hand, the employee experiences a transformation as well, which can result in loss of skills or competency due to the illness or the lack of opportunity to utilize those skills. As a result, a gap between the employee's skill level and the evolving demands of the company can widen, creating a mismatch between the employee's ability and the company's expectations. These two phenomena may not align in the same direction and can combine to create a significant disparity. And so returning to work after a prolonged absence can present various challenges for employees. And these challenges may include social isolation, social functioning and social reaction may have become less practice. And so certain character traits or uh, difficulties or tendencies may become accentuated because of the lack of feedback from others. Um, and one example I think, I hope we can all relate to is during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, remote workers who are isolated from their colleagues may have found it a challenge to then readjust to social interactions in the workplace. Flexibility and plasticity in relationships with others may be effective as excessive focus on oneself can resu result in losing sight um, of social norms. Prolonged absence from work can also impact an employee's self-esteem and self-identity because the experience of identity may shift towards the illness because the person's daily activities are focused on illness-related matters. There may be a decrease in the person's sense of professional competen competency and self-efficacy because those skills are not stimulated and the sense of professional competency may decrease. Similar to a pianist or an athlete uh, who needs to practice to maintain their skills, employees may lose their competency in their skills if their skills are not utilized. The lack of professional stimulation can hinder as well the development and evolution of those skills. Prolonged absence from work can also result in a modification of critical sense. Um, critical thinking and business rules are shaped by professional social stimulations and interactions. And when employees are not in the work environment, they may lose touch with the rules and the norms of their profession, which can impact their critical thinking abilities and problem solving skills. So returning to work after a prolonged absence can also disrupt an employee's daily routine and simple things like showering, getting dressed, putting your makeup, shaving, commuting, being on time uh, in the morning may become challenging um, because the person would have lost their rhythm uh, during their absence. So return, um, returning to work after a prolonged absence can be anxiety provoking, especially if the employee was already struggling with anxiety or anxious be because of their illness. And the recovery process itself may have iatrogenic effects at adding to the anxiety and potentially increasing the risk of anxiety disorders. On the other hand, prolonged health-related absence can have significant consequences and impact on organization as well. And here are some points to consider. When employees take prolonged health-related absences from work, there may be a need of, for the organization to hire a temporary or permanent replacement. This can lead to additional recruitment and onboarding costs, as well as the need to train and integrate this new colleague. 
Um, it may also result in loss of institutional knowledge and expertise, especially if the absent employee held a critical role. Depending on the length of the absence, there may be technological development or changes in work tasks that the returning employee needs to adapt to, and this can include update in softwares and processes and tools, as well as changing in job uh, responsibilities and expectations. And the returning employee may require additional training or support to catch up with the changes, which can impact their productivity, but also their confidence. During the absence of an employee, the organization may have had to make changes to accommodate the workload or responsibility of the absent employee. This can involve redistributing tasks among the remaining team members, reassigning roles, or even restructuring the department. And these changes can impact team dynamics, workflow, productivity, and may require additional resources to manage. And the redistribution of workload on the remaining team members can create additional stress and workload burden, which may result in decreased job satisfaction, increased burnout, and reduce overall team morale. It can also lead to resentment if team members feel that they are carrying an unfair share of the workload, leading to lower coworker support, but also potential conflicts and negative impact on team cohesion. So in summary, we have a double bind challenge. Um, returning to work after a prolonged absence can pose significant challenges for employees and it's crucial to recognize those and address those to support employees in successfully transitioning back to work. And additionally, these challenges can have significant consequences on, and impact on organization. And so it's also important for organization to proactively manage these challenges um, to support the successful return of employees. So in response, WPO has developed a model for psychosocial rehabilitation that supports individuals in successfully returning to work after um, a prolonged absence. The approach we take is not solely focused on the health issue itself, but rather on the individual's behavior in relation to their health problem, as well as their social and professional environment. Our support adopts a holistic and multidisciplinary approach that recognizes, recognizes the evolving nature of the health condition and the need to address how the person manages and copes with their condition as it progresses. So while the medical team or the medical profession provides care for the health condition itself, we aim to empower individuals to take control of their health condition and live their life in a way that is conducive to their overall well-being. The support is provided by a team of specialists who work collaboratively to address various facets of the individual's well-being, including emotional, professional, uh, and physical aspects. And it's tailored to, uh, to the person's specific needs. The model acts not only upstream of the resumption of, um, of activity to promote the return to work, but also downstream to reduce the risk of relapse and social disengagement. The support is individualized, person-centered, and in collaboration with the employee's medical team, the employer, or outplacement organizations. Um, the model was created 20 years ago. It's undergone continuous testing and improvement. Um, it's proven its effect uh, effectiveness, and more than 1,000 people benefit from it each year. So the general trend in the WPO general population is that a higher percentage of individuals return to work with WPO psychosocial support compared to the European general population without support. And this indicates that the availability of WPO psychosocial support can have a positive impact on return to work after sick leave across different durations. Um, in the context of short downtime, so three to six months, regardless of whether individuals receive support or not, the rate of resumption of activity is similar. So for instance, for individuals who took three to six months sick leave, 78% returned to work without support. Whereas in the WPO general population, the return to work rate with WPO psychosocial support was slightly lower at 76%. What the data suggests is that delaying or not stimulating the resumption of activity may result in increased difficulty in initiating recovery, and thus emphasizes the importance of timely support. It should also be noted that simply observing whether an individual receives care or not between three to six not months does not guarantee spontaneous recovery. The numbers presented in the data reflect the outcome, but when it comes to psychosocial intervention, it is crucial to of offer services as early as possible to prevent the risk of individuals experiencing a decline in recovery as illustrated in the green curve. And the data shows 
sorry. The data shows that when individuals activate the recovery on their own, the return to work rate is 78%. But without, without support, this rate drops to 50% after six to 12 months of sick leave. And so by providing timely support, we can mitigate the risk of degradation in individuals' recovery process. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we noticed that too, and it's peculiar, but, um, and then it, yeah, yeah, and then it's sort of similar uh, with the WPO general population. One explanation is that we have more experience supporting people with mental health um, illnesses. Exactly, and then we got, we needed to get trained to support individuals with, let's say, more health, um, physical health related issues. So m we're more efficient yes. working with people with, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Maybe later. Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to be the noisy, annoying one. No, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, um, I have the numbers because my memory is really bad. Uh, so, so the population with uh, mental health disorders is 261 out of 1,022, so 25% with mental health disorders. Yeah. Okay. More numbers. Um, so. Based on the data from August 2022, the percentages represent the proportion of individuals who access support for different health conditions and were able to return to work. So specifically, and this is based on data um, where support was provided for a maximum of seven months. 76% of people who access support for chronic pain were able to return to work. 74% of people who access support for mental health issues were able to return to work. 69 of of people who access support for chronic diseases were able to return to work, and 75% of people who access support uh, due to accidents and trauma were able to return to work. The overall average return to work across all health conditions is 70%. This means that on average, 70% of individuals who access support for various health conditions were able to return to work, but it's important to note that these percentage represent a proportion of individuals who access support and were able to return to work. And they don't necessarily um, imply causation. Other factors such as the severity of um, health conditions, the type and effectiveness of the support received, and individual circumstances uh, may also impact an individual's ability to return to work. And it's worth considering that return to work outcomes can be influenced by various social, economical, and environmental factors. Um, and may vary um, among different populations. So the support um, is provided by a multidisciplinary team of specialists who work collaboratively to address various aspects of the individual's well-being, including emotional, professional, and physical needs. Emotional issues related to the situation, such as anxiety, depression, social anxiety, trauma, grief, coping with chronic diseases, and pain management, are addressed by um, a team of clinical psychologists, mental health counselors with expertise in bereavement, trauma, um, and other areas, but they provide face-to-face uh, -face support, not virtual. The focus of the therapy is not long-term, but rather short-term psychosocial counseling using different approaches, mostly um, psychodynamic therapy or CBT approaches, and focused on addressing barriers to resuming work and developing effective strategies to manage emotional difficulties. We also offer professional solutions and work to mobilize key stakeholders involved in the preparation of the return to work. Our team includes occupational psychologists, mediators, who identify and address concerns that may hinder the individual's return to work. We also help individuals identify and leverage their transferable skills to facilitate either their return to work or adapt to different work settings or roles. The focus is on identifying barriers to work resumption and finding solutions with the involvement of the individual's manager, HR, company doctor, and their personal physician. 
We also believe that physical support plays a crucial role in the process of recovery and reintegration, as it encompasses the improvement of the individual's physical health and recognizes that the body is the primary vehicle through which we interact with society. Um, so just like a child who learns through touching. Um, our approach involves helping the individuals reconnect with their body by assisting them in improving their physical well-being using techniques such as sophrology and mindfulness. And by reinvesting um, in their body and creating a sense of security in it, we aim to help the individual develop a positive relationship with their body. So, and this even when supporting people with mental health issues, not necessarily physical um, illnesses, where the body may feel compromised. So physical trainers such as kinesiotherapists, yoga therapists, sophrologists assist individuals with limitation in remobilizing and managing pain through methods um, such as the Feldenkrais method, which is a somatic intervention um, designed to help people reconnect with their bodies and learn new ways, better ways to move with greater efficiency. Um, our ergonomists provide expertise in optimizing the working environment to ensure it's conducive to the physical well-being of the person. The inclusion of physical support in the management of burnout specifically has been shown to significantly accelerate recovery with a reduction in recovery time to up to two months compared to intervention without physical support. And this is just supported by internal WPO data. Um, but our team also uh, includes social workers, dietitian, interpreters, and expert patients who can provide support based on specific needs. Um, expert patients who have experience similar health challenges and can provide practical tips and advice based on their own experiences um, going through similar situations. The support provided follows Maslow's pyramid, so starting with addressing priority needs first. So for example, social workers will address financial needs, housing needs, um, before addressing more higher level psychological um, um, issues. And so our goal is to ensure that the individual's basic needs are met before focusing on like, yeah, high level needs. Um, the accompanying strategy for the return to work process of the rehabilitation department at Workplace Option is comparable to any treatment plan with a customized approach that considers the unique needs of each individual and allows them to project themselves back at work. A significant part of the care involves identifying the determinants of work, understanding the reasons for the work stoppage, and working with various stakeholders such as managers, HR, company doctors, and the patient doctor to create adjustments that can facilitate the individual's return to work. So um, the recovery and professional reinsertion must be understood as an experience and an attitude towards one's current reality. The process of recovery becomes a form of re-engagement in a life project. As practitioner, several factors are important to consider because they facilitate recovery. The person's ability to find and maintain hope in their recovery, the person's self-esteem, which is based on the recognition of social utility of their work, but also of a recognition of oneself as capable, which presupposes a sense of self-efficacy and, and motivation. We also value empowerment and the restoration of the person's power to act, which includes internal determinants, so metacognitive faculties, the ability to, uh, or the awareness um, and understanding of one's own thought processes, as well as environmental determinants, such as the attitude of their social networks, um, as well as the attitudes of caregivers. Basically, the importance of meeting someone who believes in you. Um, the person's restoration of meaning and purpose is also something to take into consideration because it's linked to the feeling of having regained control over their life and implies pursuing more realistic goals and maybe grieving more um, older goals. Um, the model is adapted for most case, uh, causes of sick leave and particularly for certain mental health concerns such as burnout, anxiety, and depressive disorders. However, Cognitive performances and social adaptations should not be hindered or impaired um, because even if they go through the various support and uh, therapies that we provide, we are going to notice a too large gap between uh, in the real life functioning. So several factors may exclude an individual um, from benefiting from the WPO support program and these factors include um, either lack of consent or unwillingness to accept the support plan 
the cognitive performance um, who, that are impaired, so ad individuals with problems with attention, memory, and executive function, concentration, memory loss, all of that, they wouldn't necessarily benefit from our support. Um, social adaptation should not be hindered. Um, so people with limited insight who lack introspection or struggle with the ability to reflect on or even become aware of their pattern of behaviors or realize that their behavior is dysfunctional, um, wouldn't be suitable for our psychosocial rehabilitation program, mainly because we work in a time frame of three to six months. So we wouldn't, that doesn't allow for such specialized support. Um, severe psychiatric disability, like schizophrenia, uh, with predominantly cognitive deficits and negative symptomatology. Um, so re reduced motivation, so social withdrawal, decreased emotional uh, responsiveness, they wouldn't benefit from the program. Um, any medical contraindication to return to work um, can exclude the person from accessing our support. And then time off sick for more than two years is an exclusion criteria because um, our data has shown that individuals who have been on prolonged sick leave for more than two years have a higher failure rate um, when enrolled in our six-month six, um, support program. Uh, is the program specifically for people who were previously in work and they're being rehabilitated back into work, or can it be for people who, who have no previous employment skills? Um, so actually, my next slide would answer that, but it's, it's mostly people who were at work and then took a prolonged sick leave and are now returning to work, um, just because of the business model. Um, so before we go to case studies, we're going to, I'm going to direct your attention to a brief two-minute video uh, that provides an overview of the beneficiary's journey through the WPO a Rehabilitation Support Program. It, it outlines the steps involved in the coordination and access to support um, by our team. Um. Accident, pain or chronic illness, emotional health issues can all lead to an extended leave of absence. Sick leave and accident. Two-thirds of the employees on long-term sick leave want return to work support. Organizing their return is complicated. This is where workplace options comes in. The promise, facilitating a sustainable return to the workplace. The main principles, volunteer work, confidentiality, multidisciplinary support adapted to the person's needs. The employer or the employer insurance company offers the service to the beneficiary employee, then assigns to workplace options. If the beneficiary expresses interest and agreement, the workplace options coordinator offers to assist the employee in developing a personalized return to work support plan. If the employee is not interested, no further steps are taken. Workplace options builds a personalized support plan. As part of the support, the coordinator mobilizes specialists and professionals based on the needs of the beneficiary and employer. The specialists form a task force to provide the beneficiary wraparound support through weekly individualized appointments which enable the employee to reach his or her goal. Each specialist is supervised by the workplace options coordinator who ensures the quality of care. The employee support concludes when the return to work objective is met, according to the contract. At any time, the beneficiary can decide to stop the service. Workplace options expertise in occupational health reduces the duration of sick leave. We anticipate and prepare for a successful recovery. Any questions? Okay, cool. It's a cool video. Um, so now that we have a better understanding of the model, um, its applicability and, and uh, limits, um, here I'm going to give you two, two um, real-world support plan examples um, to see how it's been applied. So this is a case study of a beneficiary, so we call, we call um, our clients beneficiaries, who experience reactive depression following an overload of work in the context of corporate restructuring. Our team met him at a point where he did not feel able to return to his job and contact with his hierarchy um, had broken down. He was thinking about moving to another organization, however, because he was 57 years old, a few years away from retirement, which in, in France, um, was 62, now it's going to be 64, I think. Um, that plan did not seem like a viable option for him. 
So he had isolated himself socially. He withdrew um, from his social and family spheres, and he disinvested himself from his professional environment. And this is a common phenomenon we see in burnout. And often the person who's affected um, doesn't recognize themselves in, in their behavior. Some um, would have um, acted out um, either um, through violence towards a colleague or, or attempted um, suicide. Okay. Um, this lack of recognition of their own reactions and the difficulty to protect um, protect themselves, we consider as a project themselves. Sorry, we consider has a traumatic effect, and this is why WPO practitioners take a trauma informed approach. We, when working with people who experience burnout, we work on restoring self confidence, reducing anxiety, and helping the person to project themselves and then re-examine their situation. For this person, he was referred to a psychologist who is also a EMDR specialist. Um, in parallel, we see that in situation of burnout, there's an ability to think that is lost, and therefore the first thing to do is to allow the intellectual exhaustion um, to improve. At the very beginning of the support, this person was not able to take a rational look at their situation. We used physical health coaching. We took the person out, he went on walks, and we helped him engage in activities other than their work to help with libidinal reinvestment and limit the impact of their sedentary life, restore an active lifestyle and rebuild endurance capacity. We rely on physical ac activity to re restore endurance capacity and to help the person identify the limit they must not cross. We also help them to, to identify indicators of exhaustion, such as when they start to sleep badly, when, when do they become irritable, and we help create a lifestyle such as setting a time um, to close the computer and leave the office, help them establish boundaries. And this helps the person to take a critical look at their situation and understand what brought them there. Only after the person has received emotional and physical support can we assist them in reflecting on what they need to resume their job. And this is where we can build a project for their return to work. And they can defend and argue their um, project with their employer to be efficient at work. At the very end of each support, the beneficiaries can usually confidently reach out to their managers and tell them, you know how hard I can work. I will be efficient in this organization with these reasonable adjustments. For this person, we analyze the reasons that led to the burnout restored the feeling of professional efficacy, clarified goal and aspirations, and elaborated an internal return to work plan. And as a result of our support, the beneficiary recovered a psychological state that allowed him to present his plan um, for return to work to his employer. His wishes were understood and taken into consideration. He returned to the company in a new business direction. Um, so. Our support plan involves identifying causes of burnout, implementing self-care strategies and physical recovery. The uh, second step involves committing to change by identifying individuals and social resources, providing psychoeducation related to burnout and clarifying expectations and goals. And finally, we prepare for the return to work, uh, return to employment through job coaching to accompany their integration process and prevent the risk of relapse. I don't know if I have time to go through this case study because I really want to get to, okay, I'll talk fast. <laughs> um, so this second case study I'm suggesting is on a woman who worked in a town hall in France. She had a high responsibility role in the context of organizational change because she started working with a new line manager, the mayor, <laughs> uh, which is an elected official. Unfortunately, this new mayor did not have any managerial experience and asked her a lot of things a lot of things, and that created an experience of she felt harassed. And this contributed to her anxiety symptoms. So it's important to know that this lady got her job by merit. Um, she passed an exam, she passed a competition to get this job, she has many years of work experience, she knows how to do her job, she works, she's very competent. Um, but she began to develop anxiety attacks at work and eventually she was hospitalized. When we started working with her, the idea of going back to work triggered her anxiety. And our postulate was to understand the professional context and reflect it back to her using psychoeducation. She was indeed working in a particular environment with someone who did not know how to manage. Um, and so she could be described as a victim of a mode of supervision that was not helpful to her. We validated and normalized her emotions, um, understanding that she was a victim of mismanagement. And that was decisive for her. In parallel, we used sophrology, breathing techniques, muscular relaxation techniques, and mindfulness to 
um, counter um, or contain counterproductive thoughts and manage stress, and to teach her techniques to limit anxious um, surges. This helped uh, her take sort of a meta position uh, to what was parasitic. And once she was psychologically available, we could start exploring and developing a plan for her to return to work. We worked on assertiveness and setting limits and boundaries. And we were present in the resumption of uh, activity with daily telephonic follow-ups and debriefing sessions to reassure her and affirm her reactions and her choice of responses towards her manager and her team. Um, and as a result of those interventions, this woman was able to successfully communicate her limitations and her needs to her employer. And together, they reviewed her job description, identified tasks that were feasible and those that needed to be mod uh, modified. And as a result of those modifications, she did return to work. And this is my last slide. Um, <laughs> so um, considering the specificities of the UAE, including policies on sick leave and termination, and also thinking about the risk of pearl absenteeism due to the limited sick leaves, so taking three days here, three days there, um, and potential brain drain from redeployment, repositioning, repatriation of expats, Several thought-provoking questions arise, um, and I want to conclude my presentation with these questions, questions that neither me nor my team have the answer yet. <laughs> but um, how might supportive programs, such as the one we have in France and Belgium, influence the success of psychosocial rehabilitation programs for employees on prolonged sick leave in the UAE, if we take into consideration UAE termination policies? How can a multidisciplinary approach that addresses emotional, physical, and professional adjustment be integrated into the UAE's current sick leave and termination policies to better support employees' psychosocial rehabilitation? What lessons can be learned from the French and Belgian program to inform the development of innovative approaches for psychosocial rehabilitation in the UAE and other contexts? How can employer and policymakers collaborate to create a supportive environment for employees on sick leave, taking into consideration the unique cultural and legal context of the UAE? Thank you. Okay, I think we have a uh, Q&A session after the second talk, so if you have any questions, shall we save them till then, or do we, shall we just go for it now while we're on the theme? Anyone have any questions now? Please. The main question I have is basically with the research and the work that you do, does it look at workforce, uh, workplace bullying as well? Um, does the model, is the model effective for any research that you've done on that? Be more clarify. <laughs> clarify. Um, in situations that mental health issues arise because of workforce situation that happening, like workforce bullying? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking of how to answer your question. So um, in terms of building the return to work plan and addressing the bullying, um, the, the team doesn't work as a whistleblowing. But, so, but we are going to work with the person who is being bullied to identify the adjustment they need to return to work. Um, and address the bullying. Is that, does that make sense? Yes, so, but have you had that experience with working with them when Person, situations like that happen? I, I know the team has, personally, no. I've, no. So it does include that? It does for, include. Okay, yes. good to know. tend to focus more on the symptomatic aspect. Maybe we don't focus as much on uh, return to work, even though I think it's a very common part of our practice. We get people coming in requesting sick leaves on, on the basis of burnout, anxiety, and depression. Uh, and certainly from personal experience, well, from what I see in the clinic is that uh, uh, generally when patients request the sick leave, we, we tend to oblige. I don't know if that's what people's experience is in, in clinics. Yeah? No? No opinion? Okay. So, okay, I want to thank you very much, Yara, and we'll move on to our second talk. So can we give a round of applause, please?
So, uh, moving on to our second talk today, which is, uh, sorry, which is titled uh, EMDR in a Post-COVID-19 Era Virtual Applications. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shaima Al-Fardan, who's a clinical psychologist at Mubadla Health in Dubai. Uh, Dr. Al-Fardan is a UK and US graduate and trained clinical psychologist with over 15 years of experience in the UAE and the US. She's worked both in, the, in, in both in public and private hospitals uh, mental health clinics helping individuals with a wide range of difficulties, including but not limited to trauma and stress disorders, uh, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, and substance uh, abuse disorders. Dr. Fardan is highly experienced in the field of clinical psychology and helps provide integrative care while working within a multidisciplinary team. She provides a range of treatments that are tailored to the difficulties that the individual is experiencing. Throughout her training, she specifically specialized in trauma while practicing eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, uh, EMDR, and became an EMDRIA approved consultant and trainer for EMDR therapy. So join me, please, in welcoming Dr. Shah. Okay, that's fine. Is this working? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so before we start, I do want to ask who is familiar with EMDR, just so I know how, okay, a little bit, people never heard of it before or just not so familiar? Not so familiar, okay. So I start the presentation with a brief description, um, so it's not too in depth, because um, we are focusing more on virtual applications, especially post-COVID. Um, so I'll go ahead and start. Okay, so I'll be talking a little bit about EMDR, um, how we apply it in telehealth, basically, um, and how effective it is. So it is a bit of a brief presentation in that respect. Um, as a start, so EMDR was discovered by Dr. Francine Shapiro um, in the spring of 1987 while walking. She noticed that when disturbing thoughts and memories came to her mind, um, came to mind, her eyes spontaneously started moving rapidly back and forth in an upward diagonal. So, and, and this is something that you see throughout therapy as well, and applying EMDR. She noticed that the thoughts disappeared, and when she tried to think of them again, their negative charge was greatly reduced. That's what we aim for in EMDR. Her interest in investigating this peaked, and in six months managed to create a protocol on how to best facilitate eye movements so that it would alleviate symptoms attributed to disturbing memories, negative beliefs, and negative emotions. So what it does, brain detects and protects against any incoming danger. That's what the brain does. So the experience of disturbing events increases the risk of misinterpreting situations as dangerous or safe. So just basically the sensory information that comes in does affect how it's stored, and that's the big premise that underlies EMDR. Um, there's an imbalance in the nervous system, which is caused by the cortisol release, so the adrenaline, and all of that affects what, what ends up being recorded. Um, so the information acquired at the time of the event, the images, the sounds, the physical sensations, end up being, distored, uh, being stored in its disturbed states state, thus blocking information processing. Um, dysfunctional information is stored in its unprocessed state and can be triggered by internal and external stimuli. So the hypervigilance that ends up um, happening um, is triggering all, this, all the images, all the sensations that may have been stored at the time of trauma. I already went through this, okay. Um, so just briefly, we bring up um, the triune brain model because what we're trying to do is connect the three parts. We're trying to connect the neocortex with the limbic system and the reptilian brain. That the, the idea is that when we experience trauma, there's a disconnect. So, um, Unprocessed trauma creates a disconnection in the brain, and the healing occur occurs when all three brain parts work together. 
The reptilian brain is very reactive to direct stimulation, and the reptilian brain and the limbic system are um, very closely linked. So processing aims to move the dysfunctional material out of the limbic system to the cerebral neocortex, where the rational mind is, where executive functioning is. So just a, briefly about um, what we're working with. Um, the base of the brain, so the reptilian brain, is directly connected to the spinal cord. Um, so it's responsible for our basic functions, um, reflexive behaviors, muscle control, balance, breathing. Um, it develops in the womb, and it's highly responsive to threats. So the whole idea that when we're in a traumatic situation, your heart rate may increase, your breathing is, gets affected. And we've got the emotional brain. So that's where the amygdala is. Um, it's a center of emotion and learning. Um, fight, flight, I'm sure everyone's heard of those concepts, and freeze and submission response. Um, that is organized during the first six years of life, but continues to develop. Um, and here, it regulates motivation and emotions associated with feeding, reproduction and attachment behavior, avoidance of pain and reoccurrence of pleasure. Um, and the limbic system, the brainstem, make up the emotional brain. It's important to note that when we talked about here that the reptilian brain develops in the womb, and then with the emotional brain organized during the six years of life but continues to develop, even when trauma was experienced, it, the age at which the trauma is experienced gets stored with the understanding of that age, with the milestones that are happening, with the environment, the age of when things happen, um, with how the body responds makes a difference. So an adult, two adults who have experienced similar situations but have different backgrounds, that have experienced things at different times in their lives, will respond differently. And that's what we're trying to bring up. And it, it does work um, to bring those up and work through them in therapy. So the neocortex, the rational brain, that's where the prefrontal lobes in the brain exist, and they develop last. Um, they're responsible for executive functioning, planning and anticipation, sense of time and context, um, empathetic understanding, higher order thinking, speech, the rational stuff that we need. And under threat, the left frontal lobe turns off and the right frontal lobe is abandoned. So there's no link that occurs between the limbic system, the frontal lobe. The whole idea is that with EMDR, we kind of want to bring, we want to make those connections again. So EMDR kind of removes the barriers that does occur during times of trauma. So the whole goal of EMDR is reprocessing dysfunctionally stored material, so the images, the thoughts, the emotions, um, by using the eye movements or other methods and other modalities. So eye movements is what it's famous for, but there's other modalities as well. Um, information processing, it's an information processing mechanism activated so that each new set, each set new adaptive information is integrated into the memory network, transforming the target material into a healthy functional state. Positive affect and cognitions generalize to events in that memory network, and it exposes the underlying cause of dysfunction. So what it actually looks like, um, I have a few videos that I've put up as well, but it starts with a history taking like any other psychothera psychotherapeutic technique. There's preparation, and the preparation is important because of the stage that, well, the, the symptoms that appear and how clients may respond to EMDR. With complex trauma, we might take, think, take things a little bit slower um, and have a longer plan in terms of preparation, in terms of safety, in terms of um, even awareness of body sensations and how they would respond to the whole treatment. Um, 
it's, of course, it works best and quickest when it's single incident trauma. But even with that, we would know after the assessment period. Um, desensitization is when we actually start the eye movements. Um, there's eye movements, there's um, tactile, um, and there's sound. It's all the bilateral stimulation. And then we've got installation, and a lot of the installation is changing the cognitive beliefs um, that have arisen because of the negative stimuli and the negative, negative perception um, due to the trauma. The body scan towards the end, um, closure and reevaluation. So this is just a brief video. If you have experienced something horrible and have developed psychological symptoms such as flashbacks, fears, sadness or sleep problems, you may well be helped by EMDR, a proven and effective therapy. Suppose you have been confronted with a violent crime, an accident, you have been bitten by a dog or you have had to deal with sexual abuse or violence at home. Such a powerful experience is stored into your brain with a lot of emotions. Once such a memory is stored in your long-term memory, it can bother you for quite a long time. The disturbing memory keeps coming back unintentionally, for example with feelings of powerlessness or believing you are not worthwhile. EMDR therapy can help you get rid of these complaints and feelings. At first, an EMDR therapist will ask you to activate the memory of this disturbing experience from your long-term memory. The memory is now stored in your short-term memory, also called the working memory. Then the EMDR therapist will ask you to focus on this horrible event. From there, the therapist will move his fingers in front of your eyes rapidly back and forth and ask you to track his fingers as best and as fast as you can. By keeping a traumatic memory in your mind and tracking the fingers of the therapist at the same time, the working memory gets to process a lot of information at the same time. As it is so much information, the image becomes blurred and loses its emotional charge. When the emotional charge of an image lessens, it also becomes easier to think differently about the experience. You will notice this because you feel less powerless or you feel worthwhile again. The intrusions have gone and you feel less anxious. You feel less depressed, you sleep better and because you have managed to leave the experience behind you, you start enjoying life and looking forward to the future. So if you noticed in the video, he used the fingers, and that's the manual way of doing EMDR. Um, what was interesting and fascinating through COVID is how everybody started trying to figure out how to apply this online. Um, and people still did the fingers online, um, but it, they, there had been so many different innovations of how people started um, to apply. So whether it was eye movements and putting two points across the room and allowing the client to kind of take ownership of how to do this on their own um, with the guidance of the therapist, of course, safety considered, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but it's definitely given us room to be a little bit more creative in how to practice EMDR. So we know with telehealth, it's the provision of psychological services using telecommunication technologies. Um, and different technologies may be used in various different purposes, uh, video conferencing, telephone, um, direct and indirect services with email. Um, and there are obviously, there's potential benefits and limitations and even preference. Some pro professionals and clinicians prefer online, some people don't, and same goes for clients. So, What's important to keep in mind in terms of technology, the platform chosen, um, and how secure the technology is. Um, bandwidth, if we know that the internet is stable enough to go through a session, you wouldn't want someone to be in high distress and then you've got the internet dropping out. Um, the headset is an important part when it comes to EMDR, but even just telehealth in general. Um, the voice, 
the tone, how close you hear your therapist makes a difference. Uh, obviously with record keeping, with licensure, um, the biggest thing is how to handle technology disruptions. So here, and I know this is quite a dense, I don't think you can see every single aspect, um, but it's important to basically have the setup, the technology setup, um, the preparation. I think it's not clear for anyone really, so I'll just move forward because um, I talk about these a little bit later. Um, but in terms of privacy and confidentiality, it's important for the client and the therapist to have proper space. Um, I mean, I've got clients that sometimes would do sessions out of their cars, some in their homes and in the bathroom, in the bathtub, because that's where they felt safest, especially with a lot of my trauma clients. Um, and it works. I mean, that, that's, this is where we have the privilege, honestly, of using online and remote sessions. Um, are there other people at home? Can anyone over here? I mean, you can see, with, especially with face-to-face -face online sessions, you can see if a person is distracted, you can see every single micro expression of that client. And if there's someone else in the room, you could tell that there's a distraction, but it's important to ask. Um, if there is domestic violence, I mean, this is, this is a difficult one to deal with because if there is control, at least online gives access, but then what access do they have? I mean, it's a tricky one. You wouldn't want them to get into trouble either. You wouldn't want anyone overhearing something that's so private. So it's important to consult in situations like that and just see how safe it is for that individual. So here, um, the ethical integrity. So definitely, we talked about the technology. Um, preparation and training. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of consultations on how to do this, talking to fellow EMDR therapists, um, crisis management in terms of safety, knowing that there's an emergency contact, making sure that the situation um, and the setup is safe enough, knowing the closest ER, knowing there are other EMDR therapists in the region, just having that safety down. Um, paying attention to the relational attunement part. Um, I mean, online as opposed to in person, um, there's not much of a difference in that respect if we just spend time building rapport um, with EMDR specific techniques, testing things out. Some people like um, the eye movement, so you would kind of do it on the screen. As long as the screen is big enough, as long as there's enough space, you could do it. Some people like their tapping. Um, there's a lot of software online now where you could use all modalities, the sound and the tapping and, the, and um, a ball moving left to right, which would mimic the eye movements. Um, and even with, I mean, it, it brings up all the different guidelines for virtual delivery, but even with insurance and malpractice insurance, thank God that we've come in an age where all of that is acknowledged and it's paid attention to. So what to keep in mind in terms of virtual applications? The safety factors, the stability of the client, um, high levels of disturbance, it's not that remote work with EMDR is not possible with high levels of disturbance or let's say stable or unstable. It's just that does this person, can this person work in an outpatient setting, inpatient, or do they need to be admitted? That, that's a different story. But if they can work in an outpatient setting, um, then we just take the process a little bit slower. We make sure that we spend a lot more time on preparation. Um, obviously, a thorough trauma history, the presence of dysfunctional behaviors and symptoms, knowing the triggers, assessing their physical health, um, connecting with their um, medical team if they have one, um, making sure that 
they are, um, you, you educate them about use of benzodiazepines with EMDR therapy, about substance misuse. So, of course, the therapeutic alliance is very important. The preference in terms of what modality is used. Um, some of the software that I've used has at least two of the three, which is great, because in person, I'd actually use all three. Um, to be aware of screen fatigue and eye fatigue. Um, What's really nice about self-regulation and installing Calm safe, safe Place is because the client is in their own safe, or let's say if they are, because they might not always be in their safest environment, but if they are, they could have access to personal items that give them a sense of safety and calm. And it's right there within arm distance. Um, it's important, this is where the headset really comes into play, um, that you provide obviously a soothing sound, but that they can hear you because you, would, you may need more verbal prompts. Let it go, just observe, um, just so that they can hear you through the process. Some clients may prefer to look slightly away from the screen, but uh, then that's why I like using more than one modality, because if there's um, if they stop following, then you've got sound that won't stop. Um, and it's necessary to give a more explicit signal at the end of a set, because if they're not looking away, if they're looking away and you're trying to get them to stop, um, just saying pause or stop that, you know, we've, and then what did you notice? I do apologize, everything is so small. <laughs> okay, um, so we talk about, um, let's see, informed consent, getting all the information there, the ease into online therapy, normalizing stress, establishing safety. You're assessing a lot of the, the different modalities that they prefer, grounding exercises. Um, a lot of what we do in person, we can still do online. And instilling hope. Yeah. Camera. I mean, especially in this region, um, I, I've had to put it in the rules from the beginning that I have to see the client. It's a safety issue, there's liability, I need to know that I am talking to the person that's on the Emirates ID, um, I need to know what's going on, so that's important for us to always keep in mind. Um, noticing eye movements, noticing the ab reactions, signs of anxiety, um, recognizing facial expressions, I mean, the. What's great about online, or at least, because it is still face-to-face, -face, even if it's through a screen, but you can notice all the micro, ex micro expressions um, with clients, so it, that will give us a sense of attunement, that you can recognize every single emotion or anything that distracts the client um, and bring it in to processing. Um, of course, assessing the level of risk. Um, if you are concerned, make sure that you have the mobile on hand um, and being aware of the emergency, con emergency departments and everything around that client. Um, if there is a high risk, there's an emergency person, you've got someone who's there, who's aware that might they are in therapy and they're high risk. Um, so all the things that you need to do to make sure that it's safe. So this is another video, just to highlight a little bit of the applicability of EMDR online.
So now we'll be moving into the demonstration module of the course and the intention that Mark and I have here is to show you how this can be done online. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to my friend and put myself in his hands. Uh, it's lovely to be, to, to be working with you, Jamie, in this way and perhaps uh, giving our colleagues a sense that this is very doable and it doesn't need to be quite so frightening as That's some correct. people imagine online work mm -hmm. to be. And that really, once you set things up, as we've been discussing over the previous hour in this uh, webinar that we did, once you set things up and you get the relationship, you set the therapeutic frame, you get the technology worked out, the headphones, all this kind of stuff. Actually, it's just like EM, doing EMDR in person. Precisely. Um, and we are face to face. So, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through a standard protocol uh, targeting of a distressing experience that you'd like to work with. Mm -hmm. We're going to set you up to start with, with a bit of phase two preparation in mm -hmm. resourcing. Um, I I know you, I know you, we don't need to spend history time on this case in history right. taking the phase mm -hmm. one. We'll take that for granted. So this is like a session, um, obviously with colleagues watching this, they'll have probably done the resourcing in a previous session. Sure. And the, the, so, it, you know, one spends sure. a bit of time setting things up. Right. But so we'll, it'll all be a little bit tighter and more intensely focused perhaps than uh, a normal session. And we're aiming right. to do this in half an hour maximum or so, right. where obviously normally you have 45 minutes to to an hour or even 90 minutes. Yeah, and thank How you for that. that? Sound? That sounds great. And thank you for that frame for people watching that this is out of context yet, hopefully yeah. in context enough where you can, we can benefit and great. And what we want people to experience is just sort of how we do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the content is a little bit secondary. The key thing is to observe how therapist and client relate to each other using the tech, looking at each, at each other on screen. Mm -hmm. Jamie, you're a, Jamie, you're a, dan a mindful dancer. That's your gig. Yes. <laughs> so in a sense, that's what we're doing. We're mindfully dancing with the EMDR standard procedural steps and its structures and its focus and its targeting and its AIP model. So we're going to fire you up Wonderful. and do something interesting. So let's start off, first of all, uh, Jamie, let's do a little bit of, let's install, tap in, okay. uh, some resources. Great. So should we start with a special place? I mean, it could be a safe place. It might be a peaceful, a calm place. Have you got somewhere lovely that yeah. we'd like to that you up with? Um, I do. I mean, I have one that's pretty established, um, mm -hmm. which is Lake Blood in Slovenia. Uh, so yeah, we, we can certainly tap that in, although more than the place, I, I tend to prefer more like a light stream, like thinking of the light okay. from that place coming through me right in this space where I'm at now. Okay, so would you like to close? Oh, no, the way we're going to do the bilateral stimulation, mm -hmm. which is always a challenge, Right. So what I'd like to do, like you to do and, and encourage those uh, watching this later on to coach their clients to do the same. The butterfly hug is a lovely way of doing it, mm -hmm. which actually taps onto our pressure acupuncture pressure points and mm -hmm. the meridians and so on. So you take both hands and you cross your hands in front of each other, our palms facing you, turn the thumbs towards each other, lock the thumbs together, and then turn the hands up so the fingers are pointing north. Mm -hmm. as it were and you put your fingers just below your collarbone yeah and rest perhaps if you're in a chair you could rest your elbows on the arms of the chair mm -hmm. really just settle feel really comfortable and then the tapping is literally just lifting your fingers you don't lift your hand you lift your foot yep and the sort of speed i tend to go i mean a speed that's comfortable for you i tend to go at sort of heart speed what's uh a speed. I tend to go at the same speed Feels for nice. tapping in and for processing later on, but see how we go. So you're in. I'll leave you, leave you with it. Light stream, late bled, whatever you need to do, Jamie. Tap in your, tap in your special. <sighs> I'll just tap with you as well. Thanks. We're tapping together. And you can hear my tapping, perhaps, in your headphones. Mm -hmm. It's nice. That's good. And let me know when you've got a really good sense of it. Say maybe take two or three more breaths with it. I'm really liking it. That's good.
Hope that everyone does know <laughs> there's enough research now to back it up. Um, and that dual attention does affect working memory capacity. Um, there is a decline in vividness of uh, memory image and emotionality. That's why we check the SUD. We check the SUDs in the beginning of the session and then towards the end of the protocol, and not the session, the end of the protocol, because um, it could take multiple sessions for the SUDs to reduce, depending on how complex um, the target is. Um, the bilateral dual attention stimulation aids memory retrieval and recall of true information. Um, so there is some research where eye movement during EMDR treatment sessions for PTSD resulted in an increase in parasympathetic activity um, and a decrease in psychophysiological arousal. Um, you notice lowered heart rate and sk skin conductance, so they've done a lot of research. Um, they've started to do research, and especially through COVID, with telehealth as well. Um, and one particular study ran an intensive e trauma-focused treatment program um, containing prolonged exposure, EMDR therapy, physical activities, and psychoeducation um, of severe complex PTSD um, through telehealth services. And they found that um, doing it online was as effective as doing it in person. So at least we know that, <laughs> that works. Um, other studies found that um, both in-person and virtual also did the same thing. They, did, they looked for the GAD scores, they did the testing, and they found that it was as effective. Yes, we need more studies and we need more work to be done, but they've started doing it already. What are the benefits? So we're near, near the end. Um, clients feel more in control. It enables us, even therapists, to be more flexible about our length of sessions, because we know with EMDR, if we've got the luxury, the standard is 90 minutes. Um, you notice the micro expressions, um, and it helps with emotional attunement. And um, clients have access to any items that they do find safe or soothing. A lot of, for example, if we do the container exercise, some, some people, and I remember one in particular, had um, a small chest that they wanted to, what do you call it, like a small box, it was like a, um, a wooden box that they wanted to bring in and hold in and while we did the container exercise and then left it aside because the whole idea with the container exercise is we're putting all that pain, all that distress, all those memories in that container and we're putting it aside, not avoiding it so that we can bring it back in when we do our work. Um, clients who are too anxious. So sometimes a lot of the symptoms might affect them even showing up to therapy. So that's always a bonus there. Um, sometimes, so it's more accessible for parents of young children and those with chronic health problems or caring responsibilities. So the convenience for, of everyday life. Um, and people who are working as well. It's more convenient during their lunch hour or um, it, it just beats the travel time that it takes. However, the transition time between everyday activities and a telehealth session is lost. So it's when we're going in session, an, an in-person session, there's waiting room, there's checking in. So there's a whole period where you prepare yourself to go into your session. And even when you leave, there's getting into the car or walking. There, that transition time is lost when you're doing online sessions. So it's important to accommodate for that. Um, the technology limitations 
and requirements because not everyone might have the, the, the bandwidth that's needed or if there's any interruptions. Um, so it's just make, to make sure to account for all of that. Um, the heightened emotional attunement also means that the sessions are more tiring and, they, and, and then those conducted in person. So again, the clinician needs to account for the number of sessions and the client needs to factor in um, their plan for the day. Any questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, I'm, it's clear that EMDR has most been studied in uh, PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's used in mainstream practice in any other disorders, but I would imagine that there's a num any number of disorders with sort of very hot intrusive thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, from your experience, does it work as well with, say, OCD or uh, generalized anxiety? Or it's Right at this moment, they've been trying to study, and there's research to back up everything, really. Because <laughs> the whole premise is that we are targeting distressing events. So e even how trauma is looked at is any distressing event that you may experience. So in that respect, that's everyone in this planet, whether you have a mental health illness or not. Um, with OCD, there's a particular type of EMDR called flash forward, where they would do, similar to exposure therapy, but like um, a video of what it would, the worst case scenario, and having that play out. So if you do that while processing, and then you notice that your physical sensations, all the emotions that come up by exposing yourself to the worst case scenario, starts reducing while you're processing we've got we've hit gold we we are processing we're doing it so personally um and from the research coming up honestly i because i i'm a primarily emdr therapist i do pull from other modalities but i've made it work with everything Brilliant. yeah okay uh, sure. any other questions from the audience Thank you for the talk, Dr. Shaim. I think it was very interesting to see um, both the applications of mm -hmm. EMDR and also the need for further research on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who's quite interested in different uh, technology modalities out there, um, I'm curious to know if, if there's any work done using virtual reality headsets for EMDR mm -hmm. as a potential telehealth application, especially with the newer headsets that now include mm -hmm. eye tracking technologies, facial expression monitoring, um, I'm wondering if that's a better option than using the, the sort of on-screen um, laptop or computer-based uh, telehealth. I'm familiar with that with exposure therapy. Um, I have not seen anything in the EMDR world with virtual reality. Um, it's worth looking into, as long as you can monitor, because even with exposure therapy, as far as I know, you can even monitor a person's vitals and the whole thing. Um, it, why not? I, I don't see how it couldn't work. Because even if with an ab reaction, yeah, I, I could see how it would work, but I haven't come across any research. Yeah. If I may add just another sure. question in terms of um, contraindications to such therapy, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. if, if a history of seizures or, or epilepsy, um, is that something that, that may concern uh, yes. you? It's okay. something that we would look into, especially in the history. If there's a history of seizures, if there's any pain, um, dissociation isn't a contraindication. So I know that historically people have said if, you're, if you have symptoms of dissociation, that you're con no, you can as long as you spend time in preparation. Even pregnancy is not a contraindication. You carry that stress anyways. So it's just as long as you spend enough time in preparation, know your client, as long as you're comfortable working with that particular population, you can make it work. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Dr. Haura. So thank you, Dr. Shema, for a very enriching lecture. 
I wanted to just clarify the psychotropics part. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> do, you, do you prefer them to be without benzodiazepines or anxiolytics and as in you want them to experience the anxiety uh, so they shouldn't be on any tranquilizers or yeah. what about antipsychotics or antidepressants? No. They can do that, right? That, that's okay. It's just with benzos in particular. So any sedative effect, it's the, the analogy we common use. It's like lighting wet wood. It, it, the whole point of EMDR is we want to notice um, where your emotions are at, so the subjective units of distress. If we start off as a 10, the end of the protocol, the aim is to get it to a zero. Very rarely do we keep it at a one. So if the person has taken a Xanax or has taken Rivotril or whatever um, and has calmed their sensations down, not that it wouldn't work, it just wouldn't be as effective. Um, and plus, we're trying to teach clients that there are ways to cope with intensive emotions. EMDR is one part, but the relationship, the whole part of working through, so there's, there's a lot of value in keeping clients off benzos when we start our EMDR session. I will tell clients, keep it in your pocket. It's okay, I'll accept the safety behavior. Um, and you can take it after, but let's see what we can do, because it starts getting them to delay taking the medication. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so I want to thank Dr. Shaima again for a fascinating uh, topic, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it in the future with new technologies, especially in the era uh, after COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think that concludes this is the last session of the day, I believe. So uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Shaima, Dr. Riara, okay, and thank you very much for your attendance.